This is Raven Two Cops. It's uh, part of uh, coastal East Lothian in the southeast corner of Scotland. It's a hazelwood. Not a very common sight to see in this part of Scotland, but in prehistoric times, before people discovered just how rich these lands were for agriculture, oak and hazel woodland was what you saw all over this part of the country. Unfortunately, this woodland isn't part of that original native ancient woodland. This is part of a designed 18th century landscape. And the interesting thing about that designed landscape is that the forester in charge of it was actually a young woman. She was called Helen Hope and she was the wife of the sixth Earl of Haddington. And in 1700, when she and her family moved to Tinningham House, about half a mile from here, she thought, there aren't enough trees around here and there isn't enough woodland. Let's plant some. And everyone thought she was bonkers, including her husband and all the locals, who said, no, you'll never get trees to grow here. But she did. She planted them. Well, she probably didn't put on her wellies, roll up her skirt, get out her shovel and come out planting trees herself. But she, it was her idea and she paid for it. And she planted all these trees. By the time she died at the age of 90, over a million trees of 50 species had been planted on the 320 acre hectares of their estate. So this woodland, this piece of hazel woodland, was probably planted in the late 19th century. And one of the people that's been discovering about the history of it and is actually using it as a coppice and bringing it back into management is archaeologist and green woodworker Hamish Dower. Hello yeah. Hamish. Good morning, <laughs> yeah. So Alison's here with me today and we're going to be talking about the about coppicing which is happening here. It's part of a um, restoration of hazel coppice, bring it back to a working cop coppice and what the benefits are in terms of biodiversity um, and in terms of rural crafts and supporting um, um, rural industries and the, how important it is as part of a sustainable um, type of woodland management. But as well as that, we'll be looking at the um, social history specifically of this um, woodland and the his historic context within the sits within South East Scotland. So we'll walk in together and show you. When I came here, it was a really as, as in this section of the woodland as much as it was when I first came here. So all of the hazel um, have, are really large, overgrown and quite wild at this point. But they've got lots of big stems. And this is a symptom of, um, of it be the woodland being unmanaged, basically. Um, we'll show you in a moment, but there you can see that this was definitely a coppice woodland. You can see the previous felling cuts where, um, where they were previously cut. So it has definitely been coppice in the past. But as the trees have got bigger, it's become more and more shaded, and quite dark as you can see now. But there's still a load of primroses, because I, I, I do notice in this woodland, when you come past in the spring, it's so many primroses here, you can actually smell them. The, the scent of it wafts out over the, the footpath. Yeah, oh, it's, it's amazing the colours and mm. the, that you see coming through, the, and they're multicoloured primroses. So yes, again, yeah. probably part of that picture of there being a design landscape, yes, being multicoloured. Yes. Um, a non, um, Not the native non wild, ones. exactly, yes. yeah. So, um, so a part of this that you can see is that as there's been shade, the weaker hazels have died away and the gaps between the trees have got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and this is very much why, how we've ended up in this woodland as it is now. So um, is this one of these gaps that you're mentioning or is this somewhere that you, you've actually done some work? So I've, all I've done here, this is not, I've not done much work in here at all, except planting some new trees and we'll show you in a moment, but when you want, when you have, when cop woodland um, where you've got hazel and you're coppicing hazel is being managed, you want to have the stools closer together to prevent them from branching out and, and they'll be bent and growth and you want so nice you want lots of, yeah, okay. exactly, lots yes. of straight sticks. So okay. this um, op big open air is a symptom of lack of management um, and being sense. left to do its own devices basically over time. So can we go and have a look at one of these uh, um, hazels to, so you can show me what you meant about the previous work that's yeah, been done on Yeah, absolutely. Them? Let's walk over. I'll show you. So here we are. This is one of the um, felling cuts I was talking about. Oh gosh, yes. You can see that large um, saw cut that's come across there. Mm -hmm. So this again, this is showing that this was definitely a, a coppiced hazel yes. at one point, because you can see this was quite a large stem mm -hmm. that was cut back. Um, yes. So again, when you're doing coppicing, you're typically making cutting smaller growth. Yes. So again, this might be a symptom of the kind of end of this working, mm -hmm. working piece yeah. of woodland. 
So it's interesting to see that, isn't it? Because as, as people have come to realise, hazel does naturally grow in this form, mm -hmm. open and, and, and sending out multiple shoots rather than as a single trunk. Absolutely. But, yeah. but, 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 but you reckon from the, for, from the form of that as well as from the coppice cuts, you can see that all of these trees have been managed rather than the, yeah. this is just their native growth. Exactly, plant. this is it. So part of that is just seeing just how uniform these stems are as well. Yes. With a, a wild, an un, a natural kind of hazel, it would typically be much more variation within the size of the stems to a stool. Mm -hmm. It might have been um, that they were cutting the coppicing it for firewood maybe at some yeah, point, yeah. but also it could have been that it was, it was already starting to get too big, so they had to cut it back and to manage it back to management. One thing that's really important to remember is that in the West Highlands, in the Atlantic rainforests, coppicing hazels can be really seriously a bad idea. Because if you look at these trees here, you'll see that you're looking at bare stems with bark. This is the bark, this is the actual skin of the tree. Okay. If you were in the West Highlands, you wouldn't see a square millimetre of bark. Mm -hmm. It's all lichens. I mean, people think about these hanging, yep. big sort of bushy lobaria species, as they're called, mm -hmm. um, as, the, as the important lichens, and they are important. But the actual skin, the bark of the tree, is completely covered mm -hmm. with a mosaic of lichens, and uh, as you'll see in these, uh, these, these following still shots. Here, you're not doing any damage to internationally important lichens, mosses and liverworts by cutting down the trees, whereas in the West Highlands you would be mm -hmm. damaging something that's a really serious, seriously yeah. important part of our biodiversity. Yeah, it's just as well. All right. So yes, yeah, so I know um, Brian Sandy Coppins um, research on this. They, this has often been, yes. this specific piece of coppice, the hazel has been used as a kind of case study mm -hmm. to show the contrast between the West Lake Coast Atlantic hazel and the lack of that di diversity of lichens, as you say, on the east coast mm -hmm. so yes, it's, yes this fits quite nice into that broader picture you and not just lichens but um, bryophytes and mosses mm -hmm. and liverworts um, which is in, in the, the sort of hanging is dripping um, mm -hmm. green carpets and curtains all over the trees in the west yeah. here there's absolutely nothing the green stuff that you see on the trees here is actually an alga mm -hmm. and that grows here because um, in, uh, basically it's nitrogen pollution from the surrounding yeah. farmland like nitrate de deposition blowing from when the fields are fertilised, coming down in the rain. This is what I'm talking about, this thin green coating of alga on the trees that takes the place of all the, the enormous lush profusion of um, mosses, liverworts and lichens that you get on the west coast. So we're coming out here at the, um, this unmanaged area of hazel now and you can really see, as we're opening up into this lighter area, um, the difference between the unmanaged area and the lighter area as we come into the, the section where this is starting to be remanaged and recoppiced. So, in front of us is this horrific sight. <laughs> it's a bit of a difference, isn't it's, it? Uh, well, it's not that horrific, really, if you know what you're looking at. But this is a, this is a coppiced hazel. So, Coppicing is where you cut the tree really down low to the ground, like so. Um, and you can see where I cut it back to these, the multi-stem form, like this. Um, and again, it looks really drastic, um, um, but as you'll see, it's um, just part of the process of rejuvenating the tree. A, a hazel, it's kind of an individual hazel stem, um, the natural life cycle is usually somewhere between 80 to 100 years, give or take. Um, but this is one of the great things about coppicing. If you continually cut the tree back, and again, this is not with all tree species, um, but hazel as an example, you can actually in, in increase the life of the tree um, massively. You know, there are examples of um, coppiced trees that have lived at well over a thousand years old. So you're um, increasing the longevity of the woodland effectively by ma ma keeping it in management. So yeah, but as we see over here, this will not remain like so. In the spring, all this new growth will come back just like over here. So in this area over here, yeah, is the, we coppice this at the start of this um, year. Mm -hmm. And this is all the new growth that's come back. Some of it is even taller than this in other sections, but- That's extraordinary, we, isn't it, for just yeah, one year? Absolutely. 
So you can see all, just like the coppice um, hazel over there, this was a completely bare stump where it was cut down to the ground and this is all sprung back up. Um, so ultimately in somewhere between probably six or seven years time, possibly a little bit earlier if we need to, this will be ready to harvest and it will produce a good harvest of lots of multiple straight sticks which are really useful for um, craft uses. Part of the issue with the lack of management I was speaking about earlier, when the hazel is unmanaged the gaps open up and as I was saying you want to increase the density of the hazel and fill these gaps up because that allows for lots of nice straight regrowth so they're kind of pushing it up together. Um, so part of what we can do, this, um, we've been doing some tree planting but that's not quite as successful um, as a technique compared to wearing. So this is what you're seeing here. So when you're coppicing you'll take a, a reasonably sized um, uh, stem and pleach it and pull it down to the ground peg it down to the ground with these large wooden pegs and that causes the hazel um, stem to put rootlets down into the ground mm -hmm. um, and this is the, sh the shoots that come back are, is all the, the growth from that stem. So is the stem still here underground? That's right, yes. Also, it is, yes, exactly. you can feel it, it's just yes, lying down. Just there. just there. So ultimately this will be, you can uh, at some point we'll be able to sever that from the main hazel and tree. These will be independent trees. Exactly, so that's right. part of filling in these gaps but it's far better than planting because it's been supported by that the parent tree yeah. so it's having that huge boost yeah. with its Whereas growth. these ones are just having to go on their own roots. Exactly, yeah this is it. Hi. And will they all survive? I see that there's hundreds and hundreds of stems in there, will they all make it do you think? They, they should do and part of the, the <laughs> big part of why this has been such an intensive process bringing this back into management is because um, this had been open. Previously there was a hedge that went around this but because of the, all of the lack of shade, um, light, the hedge that has, been, has died away. Oh, see, so I've had yeah. to re-establish a hedge around this to keep the deer out. Deer are, as you know, are such a huge problem for yeah. damaging trees. And if a deer sees this, it's a kind of all-you-can-eat buffet for a deer. They absolutely love all this juicy new regrowth. Mm -hmm. But amazingly, the um, work we've done to um, establish this new boundary around the hazel has completely worked so far. None of the new growth has been destroyed. Um, so in, it's, it, we stand in kind of good stead to have a, a good healthy crop of hazel in six, seven years time. But this is just one compartment of hazel. So this coming season we'll be cutting back this area of overstood hazel, um, which again, coming to next year, will sprite back like this. So it's that you have part of why the, this um, coppicing is so good for biodiversity, these compartments of light and dark, which different species of flora and fauna appreciate. So can you say a bit more about that? I mean, what's going on on these, this ground in between? You can see, mm -hmm. obviously, there's a lot more green vegetation growing here than there is in well, there underneath. Exactly. Has this all come up since you, since you did the cut? P pretty much, yeah. I mean, you can really see it, just how green it is in here compared to that darker area. And again, there are species that do appreciate the darker mm -hmm. areas, but okay. there's not really many types of um, sustainable woodland management which encourage light dark compartments it's usually growing for timber so it's all quite overshaded so that's why coppicing is so important to have that biodiversity of habitat so again so with this we will be seeing um, increased um, types of number of type of plants and, and insects and species that come associated with that. that and as you see there's plenty of the woodland product lying around absolutely yes well, so, so what's going to happen to all this so part i mean i see uh, they're in different piles of different sizes is absolutely. that is that because they're going to different the, yeah, absolutely. So we're trying to make at the, moment, the best use of all parts of the trees we can as we're coppicing. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, because a lot of it's oversized, unfortunately, some of it's um, only going to be really useful for firewood or making charcoal, which we'll show you in a, a moment. Um, but as we're going, we're, we're selecting rods for doing things like making, doing fencing work um, and the stakes as well. They're really useful for hedge laying and the like. Um, and so, yeah, we're really trying to, when we're coppicing, we're trying to maximise the absolute fullest potential, the timber from the tree, and, and create as little waste as possible. Here we are. So what on earth is this? It's not the sort of thing you normally expect to see in a traditionally managed woodland, is it? Well, it might be. Um, so this is a charcoal kiln retort. So it's for making charcoal. Um, so traditionally this actually is something that um, you would find um, often in um, traditionally managed coppice woodland. So this one is a, a, a much smaller portable version than you'd have the traditional type. You'd have a big pile of wood which would then be mounded up with earth, turf. Yes. Um, this it's is a, an Amazon sort of thing. Exactly, just yeah. the type, yeah. So this is a, a design made by um, 
for, by um, the Gifford Community Woodland um, by a chap called Nev and Paul. And this is their own design, and it's designed to be a smaller portable type, um, which you can get around. So again, not producing as much charcoal, but it's um, something that I've really only just started doing. So we had this um, firing yesterday, mm -hmm. and it's the barrel is full with um, seasoned firewood, yes. and then you have the fire driving up underneath, which goes up through the flue, and it starves off the oxygen. So, so is that charcoal that you use to make the fire? No, that would be wood. So what we happen? Okay. So why it's why it's charcoal is because we douse the fire there, yeah. so it's becoming charcoal. Yes. But the main charcoal is in. So you just the light a wood fire underneath. That's the right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then. And just do anything else in there apart from the wood. No, just the wood. So part of the process, it took about four and a half hours yesterday to do this. We probably could have done it a bit quicker, maybe down to three hours apparently, um, the other guys have had it. So we had to drive off all the moisture that was still in there and a lot of the um, the wood gases which came come out of this exit pipe here. Okay. Um, so yeah, we will see uh, now. And what's of, this? Uh, Is that so that's part of the pressure release valve, very technical. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, so hopefully in here will be a lovely big barrel of charcoal. Let's so have we'll a look. See. Okay. This is really exciting. <laughs> uh, you never know. Keep that all together. Okay. So, using this drift, I'm going to try and punch the lid of the barrel off. Got to find a good angle to get under there. There you go. Oh, that's the moment of truth. Oh man, okay. So, I just forgot to take the chimney off. Okay, the moment of truth. Uh, <gasps> look, there you go. Charcoal. We have charcoal. Fantastic. Where is So, there we have it. It's lovely, isn't, lovely charcoal. Isn't that amazing? So there should be between 15 and 18 kilograms within here for this barn. And um, this is going to be really useful for doing blacksmithing, for example, which I do a mm -hmm. bit of myself. Um, but everything from your, your barbecue to whatever you might need it for. So part, this is yeah. kind of making part of making use of the timber, which would be otherwise firewood within this woodland. So it's, so it's just completely carbonized. It's, got, it's still got its structure and integrity. That's it's right. Completely turned carbon. Exactly. Yeah. So there you go. It's fantastic. What a relief. Isn't that there you go. So yeah, a successful first burn. Yeah. May, there may, may there be many more. I'm about to empty this charcoal kiln here, but the reason I'm wearing this large respirator is because of the um, the dust that comes off this is quite not good to inhale, so really you want to be uh, wearing this PPE before tipping over. So, here we go. So now we can empty our kiln. Part of what I've been doing here, apart from just the actual management of this, is really as an archaeologist I'm being very interested in looking at the um, woodland management history specifically here um, and how that fits into the broader picture of management across this part of South East Scotland. Mm -hmm. So we've got some really nice map evidence um, from the Ordnance Survey maps which shows that in 1893 this was just a field mm -hmm. basically and then in 1906 it was planted. So this is really quite a late um, bit of planting within the broader kind of management history within the, this design landscape. Um, so from that, you know, when it kind of appeared, um, it looks based on the kind of the ring, um, the growth rings from the trees and how old they are, the, st the, st the stems, that they're somewhere about 80 years old, the oldest ones. So they're not the original trees? 
well, the trees are the original, but the stems, the lot that that only that's the last time they were cut. So the last time they were cut was about 80 years ago. So maybe around 50s, 60s thereabouts, some of them. Um, so the heyday for the cop being as a worked piece of woodland would seem to be in the kind of first half of the 1900s, um, which is really quite a tight window. So this is by no means an ancient woodland. Um, so this is quite unusual, really, because um, we don't know exactly what this woodland was being uh, managed for and a part of what we've been trying to do is kind of speak to, to local people and find about the oral history um, here because very there's not much in the way of records which survive for this area um, specifically about the management here so i've been te speaking to older people and trying to figure out what was being done here and i think um, the only thing that's really come up there's been people you know stuff about people going in to get walking sticks and the odd stick for the garden that type of thing mm -hmm. but one of the most interesting thing that's comes back from speaking to folk is that at some point the fishermen were going in here and getting sticks to make the bent sections for the creels really? yeah that's right yeah so for the lobster pots so yeah so um that's kind of set me down this um this route of trying to explore the relationship mm -hmm. of um coppicing in this area to the fishing industry. With the fishing industry, um, we're from everything from the, the back creels for transporting um, fish like across the, the Herring Road to Lauder or whatever it might be, and the um, everything from you know the the, the creels like the lobster pots and um, the, back, the 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 kind of the wibbies for the barrels. There's a huge amount of kind of coppice products which would be needed just for the fishing industry alone. So the question arises for then well, who was doing it? And then where is where are all these wood products coming from? So this is really where I started kind of reaching out and I met Gordon, who started telling me about his experience of um, collecting hazel and how this really differs, interestingly, from this specific stand of hazel in terms of the actual woodland management practice. Yourself, Gordon, you've been going in back into it was the 1960s, wasn't it? When you were yeah, last well, really? It was probably just before that, because yeah. going back a fair bit to uh, Coppison, uh, but we used the natural um, timber round about the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the harbour area, well, the, uh, in the, the countryside, and you had a. Yep, here we go. What would you call this? A hedge knife. Mm -hmm. And very, very sharp, and basically, we took stock of what well, it's, it's a bit sparse at the moment, but this is it's quite a good idea. And we, we knew what we were looking for. And here's quite a good example mm -hmm. of this little piece here. Even though it's a wee dead bit, for example, though, eh? Yeah, but that's yeah. a good example. So if this was, as say, on top of there, we're looking for something that can make a frame. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is, we would cut it very low down, but we would just it was just one yep. and it would be cut at an angle. Aye. And that helps the pre preservation of, mm -hmm. of, of the thing. And, uh, and the other thing is you kept it low for mm -hmm. dogs, animals going through um, yeah. the thing. So they didn't so, impale themselves if they yeah, were jumping in, around? Indeed, yeah. indeed, Aye. indeed. We've been talking about the, the coppicing of the stools and cut, clear cutting an area like that. But when you were doing the coppicing back in the day, you weren't working sections of woodland and cutting all the stems where you wasn't no, like no, that, was no, it? No, we just did enough at a time. It was done, I was telling Alison, it was usually, I think it was in the winter, uh, we made a lot of pots in the winter. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you're looking like any other gathering in the wild. What you're trying to do is save yourself time mm -hmm. and effort when you get home. So you don't want a thing that's that thick, it's obviously of no use, Aye. and it's just the end. So you, the experience, like any other gatherer, it's like picking berries. Mm -hmm. If you're rough and ready, you'll have half the branch away with you. Yep. But, uh, you know, and it's all to do with experience, yeah. like any other uh, professional right. job. But you were just taking what you need rather than cutting the whole... Yeah, so, oh, no, we just yeah. took what we need. And the other thing is, we use these for the frames, which we'll see later on. But the other thing is, we tended to look uh, for, for thicker ones. Mm -hmm. And these were for the flagpoles. 
for our marker pots. boys for, for the, uh, the pots. <laughs> How about you show us, when we, when we talk about the creel later on in person, maybe we see it, see it in the flesh. I wonder if, you, if we could go to one of these hazels here and see if we can find, find a stick to show you the bending process as well when we get to the workshop. Oh. If we see, to find a suitable stick, I can do the cutting if you like, it's up to yourself. Oh, no, as well, you have to So choose, choose a stick, so what kind of stick diameter would you be looking well, for? Well, this is, this is quite a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, you see, no. I'm just damaged it. That's no shot. There you go. But you see it. Yeah, it's been a while since you last done it, to be fair. Oh. A bit of practice needed. There you go. So, would you be trimming well, off the side branches? I wouldn't have hit well? that because it wouldn't be there. Yeah, well, that's it, it'd be lower to the ground. Yeah. So, would you be then trimming off yeah, the side yeah, branches yeah. as well? So, that, that's what you do. Just take it to the bottom end and you just let it run across. Mm -hmm. Go. See, and then like so. So that's it. And what kind of length you be looking for there? For the cube? Well, this is another thing. Right. I was speaking to my brother, and they used to go up. There weren't many vehicles in these days, mm -hmm. and uh, they went up on the old message bike, mm -hmm. and they put the long ones, the one that was mm -hmm. the longer t Aye. of the two, they put it four and aft with the Aye. wheels yeah, yeah. and the other ones was across the way so they would only be mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah a bit longer than that Got you. so that's it and they just bundled them up and they cycled them mm. but I mean that's in the days where people walked everywhere mm. and cycled everywhere got gotcha. you know, uh, right. the types of woodland you were going to so they weren't coppice clear like that, you were just taking the sticks oh, you right, need. You go but, through there, yeah. Aye, but the places you were going to, were they places that you had permission to go cut? Or were you just going in and helping yourself? No, How was it, it like the, the arrangement? It, you, just, you had permission as long as you weren't caught. I'm here in the workshop with Gordon. Um, and this this is now we're thinking about how we'd be using these sticks that would be harvested from you know um, up kind of back and beyond to bits of um, discrete patch of woodland where Gordon would have gone and harvested these sticks. So we're now talking about when after we looked for the right well, would Gordon would have looked for the right stick for the job and got a number of them ready to do it for a big session of creel making. Now we're going to be talking about actually how you'd be using these sticks to fashion the creel. And I'll give that over to you, Gordon. Well, obviously this is one that's, uh, as I say in the cooking terms, this is one I made earlier. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it, 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 I'll let you see, uh, if you can just imagine that these, uh, this, these are what we call the bows, for obvious reasons, and these are the top sticks. Mm -hmm. Now this is a plastic innovation, but don't worry about that. This is uh, natural wood and so is that. But basically, you had the frame, and Technology has advanced tremendously, but uh, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago, this is the type of pot that we... This one actually came from St. Al's, my friend, because obviously with the, the time span, there's not many uh, things. But what you would get is, uh, this one is two runners mm -hmm. and with smaller cross speaks. We call them cross speaks. And what you would do is you would go down to the beach and you would source a flat stone and you can see what what happens here. This is because it's all, uh, most of it's soft wood. It mm -hmm. has to be sunk. And um, you attach it to the creel so that it won't move. So that's very, normally you would have a bit of wood here and a bit of wood there so that it can't go four and out. But anyway, well, that, that, that's minor details. But um, what, what we would have, it's holes bored in these mm -hmm. uh, six places. Okay. And how were you boring those holes back in the day? Well, it was the old auger, mm -hmm. <laughs> because we didn't have power, mm -hmm. power tools initially. And it was, uh, you, you actually put them down on the ground. And it's, uh, to say it was, uh, I, think, I think the caveman had a better system than what we had. And obviously there was different sizes. But basically the size, if, if you just look at it, if you, if you got too big a size, your frame would break mm -hmm. and if you got too small it's it wouldn't small hold up the thing so basically that's just what you did and although that there's not uh, thing, if you just saw in there if you saw that off well, like that? just just there it's, it's just so that it's uh, right. i'll pop, pop, pop yeah. it over the edge yeah. of the bench make it a bit easier but the idea was 
Uh, when fishermen are in the, the coppice, their eye automatically goes on to this type of, of, of uh, shoot because if you have this, well, we'll just pretend that's in the, in the, in the hole and it goes down there, but we'll just think. So I, I would, just gently, you don't do, but it, it's quite supple. And then, so you go there and you would put it in there, obviously it's, it's, it's attached, but you see it would go, yep. you see? Ah, uh, yeah, just bend around like that. And then it, so that's it, you see, mm -hmm. looking at it now, this needs a bit more knuckle. Yep. It's, it, 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 so what you're looking for is a, a, a perfectly formed arch. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the best there. Uh, and if you're, uh, stick, we call them sticks, if your, your bow was too thick, mm -hmm. you just did this and you whittled away so that it would fit the hole. Mm -hmm. But, as I was saying earlier on, you did not, if it's two inches, you didn't take it past there because if you stripped the bark mm -hmm. and opened the flesh to it, that would be a weak bit. First thing, when it dried out, you did that, it would just snap. So yep. it's, it's defeating the purpose. So that, that was the thing, if it was too thick. And the other thing is how to attach it. Mm -hmm. Now what you did was you got a knife mm -hmm. and you put the knife across there and just tapped it. Aye, should have a little shot yep. doing that. Yep. Aye, should have a knife just here. There you go. Right. My father told me, always away for yourself, but yep. unfortunately you can't do that with this. Um, <laughs> going to get into trouble here. <laughs> uh, well, He's basically, the workbench uh, yeah, yeah. Just basically, it's, I'm trying to keep my hands away from it. Yeah, of course. So basically, you would hit it with a hammer. Mm -hmm. Use a little well, mud mallet if you'd like. Ah, there we are, there we are, that's it, that's it now. So you see it's split. Mm -hmm. So what you would do is you'd put it in yep. to the, the hole mm -hmm. and you would put it level and then you'd make a little wedge mm -hmm. and then you would put it up and of course mm -hmm. soft wood wedge and it expands uh, and then you could put a nail okay, to hold, just to hold, to hold it, in, it in there. That's basic uh, uh, and then this the, the, the longer straight one, see, we'll just, because yeah, we've not you. used that yeah, one, top, that's there. Um, this is what we call a top stick, and we never had, initially it was always whipped on, because we never, mm -hmm. and you always put them, that's slightly too high, I have to recommend it, but you went like this, and you, you did a neck there, I think you could maybe, yeah, I think you can see it in this one, it's broken. Oh yeah. But yeah, you put a little nick there, uh -huh. and then you whip it mm -hmm. with a needle, gotcha. and, and and you you use um, thin nylon because thin nylon bites into it, mm -hmm. and you get um, it's tighter than a nail. Gotcha. Uh, probably see how that middle one's done. Mm -hmm. That's just lashed on. That's yeah. just lashed on. You see, but, and then you can see the modern version, and this bit of plastic. It's a stainless steel screw, mm -hmm. which is just uh, turned over. But that's your basic uh, frame. But this is another thing. Mm -hmm. These eyes, this is what you call a hard eye, mm -hmm. as compared to a soft eye. A soft eye doesn't have any framework in it. It's, um, there's an overlap, the mesh is at the top. Or it's, that would do as a soft eye, mm -hmm. but it closes up. This opens it up for the lobsters getting in, but mm. it's easier to get out. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea, and we used to use the thin end of the cage, and you can see it there, we just split it the same as we did that one. Yeah, yeah. We just split it into length like that, and then you, you bend it round, and there you are. It's whipped there and whipped there, and that's your entrance. Mm -hmm. Right, good. The, the whole idea is you use the material mm -hmm. and that's where you get the, the coppice. Mm -hmm. if, you. if you were on an island that didn't have any uh, a, a coppice wood, well, what, you, you would you would have you to make, go ashore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 so, but, uh, this is, so yeah. Gordon, yeah. with this type of um, peel, how long would you expect for it to take to make it and then how long would you expect it to last in the sea, oh, generally well, speaking? I know it depends on the conditions. Well, yeah, the second but, part is that how long is a bit of string yeah. because up until two days ago, the weather has been quite 
uh, latent, uh, mm. just, what's that? and you saw what happened. Mm. It's not to avoid the question is it's it's all to do with turbulence. Yes. Right. Now there is a lifespan that if you left it in the water, you know, it, it, it would deteriorate. Mm -hmm. But it's basically it gets rubbed mm -hmm. with the movement. Mm -hmm. with, with yep. the so it really depends, so, really. But it'd be, yeah, yeah. If, it, and you, of course, you'd be repairing the creels as well, yeah, wouldn't you? Yeah, for yeah. So be, you see, we've never, so I've never depend, seen this for about 20 years. Well, maybe not that. Yeah, 15, 20 years. But they got damaged. Mm. And, you know, we would put pieces in. And the skill of a, a fisherman doing it is each and every one is within a millimetre. Yeah. And it's your hands that do that. You know, you've yeah. seen the, there's a film about that. Mm. But then now it's all mechanised. Mm. You know, mm. the, the, the factories churn them out mm. and then you just... How long would it typically take to make a crew like this? Yeah, that's another good question. Well, the old men in Dunbar used to reckon if you made a creel a day, mm -hmm. now there's 365 days in the year, mm -hmm. but it's it was just a yardstick. Yeah. But in the old days, if you had a hundred creels in, you should have had a hundred creels in reserve. So the type of coppicing that we've um, been seeing at Tinningham, at Ravenshew, it's really kind of falls into a kind of um, a kind of classic type of coppicing that you maybe see down in England, a stand of hazel that has been coppiced um, in sections uh, all at once. Um, and this is really interesting because it stands in contrast to the more kind of adventitious, opportunistic coppicing, if, if you like, that Gordon and other fisher feet folk would have done in the past. And this is a type of um, coppicing woodland management which I think has been really esca escaped under the radar and from the book The Page of History. Um, so it's really important to recognise that as a, t a form of management of sorts. And again, other types of communities, such as apparently I've heard the travelling community in the past, would have um, taken um, from the hedgerows and like for making baskets and like. So there's oh, definitely a wider tradition there as well across Scotland. So I think drawing attention to it's a really nice case study. Having it's a, it's an unusual case study with having the cops at Tillingham because we don't know yet entirely the story there. So there's a lot. There's more research to be done there, but it stands nicely in contrast. It would seem to the broader picture of opportunistic coppicing. And while the opportunistic coppicing has probably happened at Tillingham at some point at the cops, um, based on the oral history that I picked up speaking to people in the community, um, it seems that uh, there's a really quite a big trend of this opportunity to snip coppicing like the type you'd have done in the past, Gordon. Mm. And, you know, there's a huge amount of um, coppice products, sticks that would have been needed just for the fishing industry alone. And obviously all the many other types of rural crafts that would have needed it, agriculture, packaging, this sort of thing. There would have been a massive demand across history, thousands and thousands of packs of you know, sticks. So obviously we know about the, um, the baskets, for example, and the creels. But where's all the wood coming from? So this is a question. I think having this conversation and talking about your recollections, Gordon, is drawing attention to the fact that actually we not, while we may not have as many surviving stands of coppiced mm. bits of hazel like at Ravenshew, it might be because a large part of it was this more opportunistic, adventitious coppicing um, of the sort that you're talking about there, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. So just because it's not survived into the history books does not mean that we do not have a, a history of woodland craft and coppicing in Scotland. The other thing is, it's far be it from me to, to speculate, but it's not out with the realms of possibility off the top of my head, splitting these either mm -hmm. half or into three or four, you know, and then you're getting something that's supple and durable, mm -hmm. you know, to form, we are forming into this uh, uh, idea for, for, for our purposes, but, you know, you've got um, you know, right from yeah. I mean, Roman Greek times has been. And this is this is the sort of thing. This is an example yeah. made by um, yeah. Mary oh, no, Mary Nairn made this yeah. um, replica of a traditional yeah. um, fishing creel basket. So you know, this is the kind of thing you'd have um, mm -hmm. the fishwives walking on the Herring, Herring Road, stacked with for occurring with a basket on top called a skull basket. It's just a smaller version of that. It, it's, yeah, it's the same. Ice. It's a type of creel, exactly. So you know, this is a creel. Got, this is another type of creel. The, the, the framework yeah. there, and then you've so got yeah, the it's a creel board. because it's yeah. curved over a bent stick, like that so. Would take a lot of uh, punishment. Absolutely, aye. No, but no. you can see 
this represents yeah. well, woodlands. Like All these products represent managed woodland of a sort. And just because I know you were only going to, you weren't cutting on repeat of repeated uh, no. fashion with stools. Yeah. But I'd imagine kind of you were, yeah. but more broadly though, if you think about if you're cutting on a six to seven year cycle, you'd, the sticks would be coming back yeah. seven years after the fact. So this is why I'd argue yeah. it is still a form of cyclical oh, yeah, management indeed. in a sense, yeah. Yeah. even though it's- We didn't uh, look at it in that aspect. You know, yeah, that, that, aye. So this is why yeah, coppicing has existed. It's just less visible possibly in Scotland um, compared to say England, you know.